Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again to uh, uh, Don and uh, uh, ETC for inviting me here. It's really an honor for me and um, an opportunity for me to try and give a little back to uh, Don because I owe her so much. And so my time here is really for her. Um, I was an engineer before I became a surgeon, so that's my relationship to testing and all that stuff. I thought it was important to um, add a surgeon's perspective as far as developing a product because in this field getting the surgeon's input on product development is very important and so I'm going to talk about that and give an example of a real uh, product that I developed before we started Spine Frontier and kind of take you through that journey. <coughs> so if you're about to develop a product whether you're working for a company internally or you have an idea on your own, uh, this, this lecture will help you. And the first thing I think is important for you to consider is, is there a demand for your product? Because there is no shortage of patent application in the patent office. I can promise you that. And there is no shortage of ideas. And literally every week I get new ideas pitched at me for Spine Frontier. And they're great ideas. But we have to ask ourselves, what's the demand for that? And the next thing we do is, you know, look at what the current system is. So if you come up with an idea that's so revolutionary and there's no real demand right now, you know, it, it's a problem. But if you're coming up with an idea that has precedence, you have to understand what's the opportunity. And one way to look at the opportunity is to look at the limitations of the, si of the system. And sometimes I get s s uh, someone would criticize the system. You know, I'm not sure exactly what's the opportunity there, but look at the, at the uh, limitations. And next thing is, look at the FDA pathway that you're choosing for your system. Is it an, F is it an IDE or is it going to be a 510K? And in that respect, that will affect your design rationale. You know, because if you just come up with an idea out of nowhere, and uh, y you realize that the, after talking to Don, that the pathway for FDA clearance is an ID, IDE that changes your business model. And the other thing to do today is to make sure you have an idea that has some, some uh, IP protection around it. And look to the future, because if you generate one idea, chances are that that's not the final iteration of that, right? If that were the case, we would not have the internet today and we would not you know, be where we are in technology. There's always a, an opportunity to improve on it. All right, so I'm going to take you through how we developed the uh, percutaneous pedicle screw system, uh, the Mantis for striker spine. And the first thing we did was to, to see that there was a demand or a need for surgery that can be done in an outpatient setting. And we saw that we have to find ways to operate on elderly patients that are less risky. And so we also wanted to go from the incision on the right to the incision on the left. So the, the demand to limit how much dissection that you do uh, prompted us to look into solutions that avoid that much dissection. And when Dr. Foley and his, his colleagues came out with this uh, paper and Medtronic released the sexton system, I think what that did was immediately started a interest in percutaneous pedicle screws and that confirmed to me that the demand for percutaneous pedicle screw was real. Okay? At that point I decided I should jump in and, and first thing I mentioned was now that you established the demand, what are the limitations? Okay? Not just criticizing the systems, what are the limitations? And I listed all those limitations here. And from that, I decided what are the design rationale for this new system that we want to develop. And so we start going through the competition and look at the design considerations for this new system, right? And these are listed these here. And we went through, and th those are actually the actual list uh, that I came up with. And then at the end of it, this is where we ended up with a system that we wanted to be simple in its design and the question then next question on the list was can we patent this and protect it because if we can't then the value may be questionable right so i filed that patent uh with the initial design being what it is here but uh 
the next step was if I'm going to sell this, I need to come up with a, a, a name that can be marketed. And so I came up with this acronym for the Mantis. We trademarked that. The next step was let's decide what do we want to do with this system now? Do you want to make a whole company out of it? Do you want to pitch it to an, a, a company and sell it? Do you want to license it? And also look at what's the regulatory pathway. And in this case, we wanted to do a 510K. We consider CE mark. And so at that point, we uh, felt, you know, we'd like to sell it to a company. If we wanted to take it on our own, then we would have to incorporate a, com a company, get surgeons to test it out and prove the concept. And that's actually a good idea because you can build value in, in the product at that point. So these are all considerations as you develop your product. And now, in our case, we decided to partner with an outside OEM company and develop the prototype and prove the concept out. And this is what we did. We went to SolidWorks, which is standard in the product design phase, and tried to, to simplify the design and illustrate how it would work, come up with some instrumentation. And finally, that was the final uh, prototype design. And that was actually testing in a cadaver. And so we felt... Um, as we got to the point where we wanted to finalize our design and we're doing the cadaver testing, we realized we wanted to be the ability to contour the rod outside of the uh, body before we put it in. So, you know, you develop the product, the team comes together, you get it to the surgeon and you get additional feedback. You, go, you keep going back and forth between, between the clinical setting and your product development team and engineers. That's really an important step. And then once we felt that we're ready to go in the surgeon's hand, we get a chance to um, test it out finally. Then because our idea was to sell it to a company, we package it nicely. And at this point, being the person who came up with the idea doesn't mean you're going to be the person that's going to sell it. And, and so at this point, we, we, brought, we had someone else uh, go out and pitch it to the companies. And uh, my role was just to test it. And then we sold it to Stryker. At that point, you know, as the, um, the inventor, you can make a choice as to how much do you want to participate and champion this, this product from here on. And in my case, I decided I did not want to champion the product. I want to move on and start a, start a whole new company. And, um, but, you know, as, a, as an inventor, you have the ability to to participate in championing and marketing the product. And this was an idea that we came up with. We wanted to, to really push this product. Uh, this, this was right around Transformer 1, right? You get the idea. <laughs> this is old stuff now. But back then, I was very excited. I was into it. Um, but then once I jump ship, I don't know what happened to the product after that, actually. Now, the next thing is you get it in the surgeon's hands, you're still in the product development because you're, you know, you're refining it, you're trying to see what's the, what are the changes you need to make, what's going to be the next generation of your product. And so you start you know, going with the surgeons and looking at the clinical scenarios in which the surgeon can, can apply it. And so we started to accumulate cases, uh, see how patients do, those are your clinical trials. It's still part of your product development effort. And you know, you, you can see the difference in these incisions here compared to the, where we started out, you know, the, you know uh, to, to define the demand. Uh, at this point, you should really feel good about yourself developing a product that definitely improves the clinical scenario. And then we started to expand that and uh, look at what's the next iteration of your product. How do you make it better? And here you can see we're marrying this to facet screws. At that, at that, that's now 2011. We sold this to Strike in 2005. So six years later, uh, the patents finally got um, published. So you develop your product and you file your patent, but it takes four to six years before you actually get get the issued patent. You could have waited until it was issued, see if it generated more value, but you also make taking a risk. You have to balance that. You know, when do you exit from this product? 
versus you know your your value balance and at this point for for me as I look at the competition and where the mantis fit I thought another option which was even less invasive was facets fixation and so I started Spine Frontier with the facet fuse because I felt it was better than percutaneous pedicle screws so the idea is to continuously be pushing the limit so we started out on the left with a with a demand for a better system than open surgery we got to percutaneous pedicle screws and then we got to one incision with facet screws so you know if you sit on your your product too long you can miss the boat so always you know trying to generate new ideas and so I started to again the process of looking at the next generation of percutaneous pedicle screws and at the same time that we we started a new company looking at facet screws and this is the newest percutaneous pedicle screw system and, I, and it's a paradigm shift from the Mantis and the other uh, systems out there um, and we released this back in 2011 at NAS and this system is quietly uh, uh, being beta, beta tested right now actually in surgery so I'd like to uh, um, show you how much I'm in love with the Mantis <laughs> So I haven't developed a system. We're now in a you know market stage, marketing stage of it. And so you know you, you try to uh, illustrate exactly what you want your system to do, and I think animation is a great way to do that. So I'll just show you this new paradigm in percutaneous pedicle screw fixation. Okay, uh, at this point is where we divert from any pedicle screw system, Perkness system that's out there. Instead of pushing the rod, you now pull the rod through. So this is the whole paradigm shift that you won't see anywhere on the floors here. But this currently isn't being used outside of this convention. So essentially you can go from T2 to the sacrum now very safely without any fluoroscopy because basically you pull the rod through instead of pushing it we also attach a pusher to it so as you're pulling it you're pushing at the same time you have ultimate control of where you the rod ends up so you don't you you can choose the appropriate length of your rod and you can always control that rod at any point during the operation you can't do that with any system right now once you're in you're in we can take this out and so if the other thing we do is we keep we put a longer tulip on the on the uh, on the uh, uh, screws so once you go percutaneously it's easier to get your set screws down so so that's a new paradigm uh, any questions <laughs> Questions about the music?